1971, then President Nixon declared a war on cancer. And we've been fighting that war ever since. And in the almost 50 years since that declaration, the world has spent, best estimates are, something in the range of half a trillion dollars on cancer research. And we've made lots of progress with that money. We understand a lot more about cancer than we used to. We've come up with a lot of treatments. Patients can survive longer, some can even be cured. And the quality of life has been improved. But by no stretch of the imagination can we say that we've been able to cure cancer. So let's take a look at the numbers. In Canada, in 2017, 200,000 Canadians will have been diagnosed with cancer. And in the same year, 80,000 Canadians will have died because of it. In 2017, the average Canadian has a one in two chance, lifetime chance, of getting cancer, and a one in four chance of dying eventually of that disease. To bring it down to sort of a smaller level, I decided to look at colon cancer, because that's a cancer that most people have heard about. It affects men and women approximately equally. And in Canada, in 2017, there were about 27,000 cases of colon cancer that were diagnosed. That works out to 75 cases a day, or one person being diagnosed with colon cancer every 20 minutes of every day for the entire year. And that's just in Canada. So no, we haven't actually cured this disease. And as a cancer researcher, and also as a member of the taxpaying public, I have to ask myself, why have we not been able to cure cancer? After all this time, with the money and the brains that have gone into this research, why have we not been able to cure it? And what I'm going to suggest to you is that the major reason we haven't been able to cure this disease is because cancer is an incredibly rare disease. Now, I appreciate the numbers that I just gave you don't really support that statement, so let me explain a little bit about what I'm thinking. So first of all, what is cancer, actually? And I think most people are pretty comfortable with the idea that cancer is an uncontrolled cell growth and division. So a cell that shouldn't be dividing starts to divide, creates more cells which make a mass, we call that a tumor. The tumor grows, it impinges on organs and organ systems, and it eventually affects function. It takes nutrients from the healthy cells, and parts of the tumor can break off and go elsewhere in the body, causing secondary cancers, and if unchecked, it will eventually kill. So we all understand and appreciate that. But notably, cancer comes from a single cell. It starts with a single cell, and we know that there are at least 200, if not more, cell types in the body. So right away, since every one of those 200 cells could potentially originate a cancer, the idea that cancer is a single disease is something that we haven't really believed for a long time. And again, I think most people are comfortable with the idea that cancer is at least 200 different diseases because it can come from any one of these different cell types. So those 200,000 Canadians that I mentioned from 2017, they don't all have one disease. That's actually 200,000 people that have some distribution of about 200 different diseases. So while that makes any given cancer much more rare, it still isn't the kind of rarity that I'm talking about. So we're going to have to explore a little bit more. So what is it that actually causes cancer? We don't actually know the answer to that question, but we can divide the causes into two major categories. So the first category would be what I would call environmental causes. So in that category, I would include things like exposure to carcinogens, so perhaps uh, smoking, um, other carcinogens that you may ingest at your place of work or at your home. Probably there's a lot of environmental influences from other lifestyle choices and diet, although we're not so clear on how those work. Uh, exposure to UV rays from the sun could be considered an environmental cause. And even exposure to pathogens, such as vi viruses and bacteria, can actually increase the risk of cancer. We don't fully understand the environmental causes particularly well, but we do start to appreciate now that they are quite important. But the other major category of causes of cancer falls under the umbrella of genetic causes. And we have realized for quite a long time that at its heart, cancer is actually a genetic disease. 
Now, when I say that, I'm not really referring to uh, the kind of genetic disease that is passed on from parent to child. That's an inherited disease, and although a very small proportion of cancer is inherited in that way, it's less than 5%. So 95% of all cancers are not inherited from parent to child, and yet they are still genetic diseases. And what I mean by that is that there are changes or variations or mutations at the level of DNA that are probably driving single cells to start down the cancerous path. So let's talk about that a little bit. So I told you that there are more than 200 cell types in the body, and those cells have specialized functions that they have to perform. And some of the functions cells have to perform are common amongst all cells. How do cells actually perform those functions? Well, they use um, what are called proteins, which are the workhorses of the cell. So proteins are the molecules inside the cells that can do all of the jobs that the cell needs in order to keep functioning and to keep doing all the things to keep your organ systems going. The proteins themselves work in pathways so that they can um, complete all of the functions that are required, whether they're general functions or specialized functions. But where does the cell get the information to make all the proteins? And that's where the DNA comes in. So the DNA is actually a blueprint or a roadmap that provides the instructions for making any protein that the cell could ever need. So you can think of the DNA as just essentially an encyclopedia. And inside that DNA, there are chunks that are called genes. And each gene provides the instructions for making a particular protein. Now, most cells don't need to be able to make every protein that there is. They only need to make proteins that they need at that particular time. But every cell is provided with a complete instruction book, and we call that the genome. So every cell in our bodies has a complete genome, and what it does then is it picks and chooses the instructions from the genome that it needs to make the proteins that are required for the pathways that need to be functional at a given time. Because, however, the genome has to include the instructions for all proteins, it's actually extremely large. And because it's large, that makes it somewhat vulnerable to mutations or changes. And so you could imagine a situation where, if there is a mutation or a change in one of the pieces of the instruction book, that is the instruction for making a protein that normally would be part of a pathway that, let's say, regulates cell division, you can understand why having a mutation there might cause a particular cell to start moving down a cancerous path. So how do, can that actually happen? Well, there's two major ways, really. One of them is, is that cells have to divide all the time. So this is just normal cells. I'm not talking about cancer right now. But cells have to divide to replace cells that are dying just in the general um, scheme of things. And whenever a cell divides to make a new cell, which we call a daughter cell, it actually also has to copy the entire genome so that the daughter cell also has a complete instruction book. Well, you can imagine, if I told you that you had to copy the Encyclopedia Britannica down for your child so that they could also have a complete instruction book, you're probably going to make a couple of typographical errors when you're doing something that large. And the exact same thing happens when a, when a cell has to make a copy of the genome for its daughter cell. For the most part, the mistakes that are made um, are actually corrected. There's very good machinery in cells, but sometimes a mistake can get through. And if that mistake happens to be in a gene that codes for a protein that is really important in regulating cell division, then the cell that gets that mistake is not going to have a functional pathway. The other way that mutations can happen is actually through exposure to the carcinogens. So a few minutes ago, I talked a little bit about the environmental causes of cancer. And one of them um, is these carcinogens that we're exposed to. And sometimes carcinogens can act directly on the DNA to cause mutations. So again, you can imagine if you have a cell where that has happened, and now the cell has a mutation in the instruction for one of these important proteins, that cell is going to be compromised in its ability to be properly regulated. And not only that, but that cell then, when it passes on its DNA copy to its daughter cells, is going to be passing the, mis the mistake or the mutation along as well, and then it's going to be an exponential growth. So I think it's pretty obvious in some ways how these kinds of mutations can actually lead a cell down a path from being normal to becoming cancerous to becoming a tumor. So about a decade ago, maybe a little bit more, 
Researchers began uh, to get the opportunity to be able to read the entire instruction book in both tumor cells and in normal cells. And we do this through a process called um, whole genome sequencing, where we can essentially now very cheaply, very quickly, and very accurately read all of the instructions in the instruction book. And we can, if we take a bunch of tumors and we do the sequencing, and then we take a bunch of normal cells and we do the sequencing, then what we thought we were going to be able to do was figure out where the mutations were, which proteins were being affected, and once we did that, we figured we were going to have the answers to what it was that was actually driving cancer. So people were pretty excited about this. We were going to be able to do all this sequencing in tumors and in normal cells, and out of all of that was going to fall the answer to what was causing cancer. And of course, then the cure was probably not that far. So what happened? Well. Here's a very small example of what happened. So this is an extremely simplistic example. I've got six tumors up here, each represented by one of these circles. And let's say that these are all, these are from six different people, but these are all the same type of tumors. So let's say they all come from colon epithelial cells. So we would call these all colon tumors. And on the surface, they look very much the same. And if you were to take them and look under the microscope, they would still look very much the same. However, when the scientists started to sequence the genomes of these cancer cells, it turns out that they were all different. And that's not really what we expected to find. So people have now done this over and over again in many, many different types of cancer for tens of thousands of tumors. And what we keep seeing over and over and over again is that when you sequence the genomes of these tumors, they're not the same. So we can't just put them into nice, neat bins. There are certainly some mutations that occur more often than others, and we've gotten some information about what might drive cancer. But for the most part, this was a very disappointing exercise because it did not give us the answers that we thought we were going to be able to get. Instead, what it told us is that every tumor is different. And it got worse than that. Because after that, we began to get the ability to apply these sequencing technologies in more and more fine ways. And eventually, we got to the point where we could actually sequence from individual cells rather than from entire tumors. So when you do that, if you take a tumor and you open it up, obviously it's got multiple cells inside, we can now actually pull out one cell at a time and sequence the genomes of those cells. And it turns out that when you do that, the cells themselves have different mutation spectra. And then to add insult to injury, it turns out that we discovered that tumors are not static entities. Instead, tumors actually evolve over time, usually actually in response to the treatments that they're being given. So when we're giving a treatment to somebody to try to kill the tumor cells, the tumor's not taking that line down. It's actually making more and more mutations, trying to evade that treatment. So now, we have a situation where we've gone from having 200,000 people with cancer to having 200,000 people with maybe 200 different types of cancer, to having every cancer looking slightly different, to having an individual cancer potentially having more than one disease process going on, to having it change over time. How do you study a disease where every instance of the disease is different, and where every instance of the disease may actually be more than one disease process, and where it changes over time. So what do we do? Cancer is now, as you can imagine, incredibly rare, because no two cancers are exactly the same. And the answer seems to be, and this is coming more and more from the research community, is that we need to start listening to the biology, maybe in a different way than we have been doing before. So I told you a little time, a little while ago, that in these different cell types we have, that the way the proteins work in the cells is that they actually work in pathways. And so what I've drawn for you here are two exceedingly simplistic pathways. So the first pathway on top has three proteins, A, B, and C. And imagine that those three proteins work together to, form some, to perform some function in the cell. And the second pathway also has three proteins, A, D, and E, and let's say they work together to perform a different function in a cell. And of course, no, protein, no pathways in cells are actually this simple. I'm just trying to make the point that proteins work together in pathways. 
And I'm also trying to make the point that some proteins, actually probably most proteins, take part in more than one pathway. So it's not quite as neat as one might want it to be. Okay, so imagine now that you have two tumors that you want to sequence. And let's say one of them is a colon tumor and one of them is a lung tumor. And you sequence the genomes and you find out that in the colon tumor, there seems to be a mutation in the instruction or the blueprint leading to the development of protein B. So protein B is now not working. So that top pathway is not working particularly well. And now let's say in the lung tumor, you do the same thing, and you find out that in the lung tumor, it has a mutation, meaning that it can't make a functional protein C. Now, traditionally, we would have put those tumors in completely different categories, because one's colon, and one is lung, and one is mutated for protein B, and one is mutated for protein C. But maybe what we need to start doing is listening and thinking about the fact that both of those tumors actually have the same process, the same pathway that has been impacted, and maybe they should actually be binned together. And by the same token, if I have two colon tumors and I do the same sequencing exercise, and I find out that one of them is mutated and can't make protein B, but the other one can't make protein D, even if they're both colon tumors, maybe they are not the same thing. And maybe I shouldn't be putting them in the same bin. Maybe I should be putting them in two separate bins because the mechanism by which they're getting cancer may be extremely different. This way of thinking about cancer, about reclassifying the way we look at things, about no longer relying on either the cell type or the exact mutation, but instead taking a step backwards and trying to find a balance to understand the pathways that are actually being impacted, if we start to do that, then maybe, just maybe, we will win this war. Thank you.